Welcome to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast for the March 14, 2022 issue, Season 1, Episode 6. Evidence-Based Hair is a podcast produced by the Donovan Hair Academy and addresses new research in the field of hair loss. This podcast was created for practitioners of various backgrounds, but regardless of whether you care for patients with hair loss or simply care about the topic of hair loss, this podcast will be of interest. Evidence-based hair is for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The second Monday of each month is dedicated to the topics of telogen effluvium, traction alopecia, trichotillomania, and tinea capitis, or what I call the four T's. And we'll be reviewing six studies from the past month or two in this particular area. We'll be talking first about telogen effluvium and the risk of telogen effluvium in those who use isotretinoin. We'll talk about post-COVID hair loss, and we'll talk about a very interesting finding, and that is red bands in the nails in those who have post-COVID telogen effluvium. We know hair and nails are like cousins, and this is a really important finding for us. Then we'll move on to talk about tinea capitis and the use of trichoscopy, or these magnification-type devices which can help us see the hair in different ways that we can't just see with the naked eye. Then we'll talk about trichotillomania and how some stimulant medications that are used for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder may impact the risk of trichotillomania. This is an emerging topic and we'll look at an important case. And finally, we'll talk about traction alopecia and a study showing a rare link between ulcers on the scalp and traction alopecia. The references for all of these research studies are in the show notes that accompany this episode. So let's turn first to talk about telogen effluvium or hair shedding. A very interesting study published in JAD International in March 2022 looked at hair shedding in users of isotretinoin for acne. Isotretinoin is a common medication used by many dermatologists for the treatment of acne, especially acne that is associated with scarring. This is a particularly worrisome topic for patients. Patients are aware through their own reading, through friends, through the internet, that isotretinoin may cause shedding. Patients often are of the view that it's a very, very common association but we know from past studies that it's probably not that common, but what really are the numbers that we can give patients? And so this was a study which set out to review all prior published studies that looked at the frequency of hair loss in those using isotretinoin for acne. And so the authors compared the risk of telogen effluvium in those using less than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram and the risk of shedding in those using more than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. And so it was a systematic review, and the authors pulled out all studies from the literature that involved the use of isotretinoin for acne, described hair loss, and were of observational or experimental design. And so they identified 22 studies that fit these particular criteria 16 were prospective studies, three were retrospective, and and three were cross-sectional. In those using less than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, there were 565 patients. In those using more than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, there was 3,375 patients. Telogen effluvium occurred in 3.2% of patients using less than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, and in 5.7% of those using greater than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. And so overall, about one in 20 patients who use isotretinoin are going to experience some type of hair loss. This is generally in the form of telogen effluvium, and for the vast majority of patients, we expect it to be temporary. The risk seems to be dose dependent and those using higher doses above 0.5 milligrams per kilogram may have an almost twofold increased risk of shedding compared to lower doses. This is a really interesting study. It gives us some sort of a quantitative number to give to patients about the risk of shedding. 
for the most part, we believe that this is a temporary type of hair loss, telogen effluvium. I think it's really important to keep in mind that prolonged shedding in those with androgenetic hair loss or those who are about to develop androgenetic hair loss can, can unmask or precipitate androgenetic hair loss. And so if someone has hair shedding of any kind, whether it's from isotretinoin or weight loss or another medication, and six to nine months later, the patient says, you know, my trigger is gone. I stopped the drug. I stopped my diet. I just didn't get my hair back. You need to be thinking about androgenetic hair loss in those patients. And that's just a pearl that we need to think about as we talk about telogen effluvium. So let's move now to talk about post-COVID telogen effluvium. And we've been talking about this topic a few times on evidence-based hair. This was a study from the April issue of the, of the JMV. And so Hussein and colleagues looked at 19 studies of patients who had telogen effluvium after COVID-19 infection. There were 465 patients who were diagnosed with post-COVID TE in their review. Studies ranged in size from a single patient to 191 patients. The median age of patients was 44 years and 67% were women. And so the authors estimated based on all of these studies that the mean duration between COVID symptom onset and the appearance of hair shedding was 74 days. And so again, a helpful study reminds us that telogen effluvium after COVID-19 is much more common in women. And the studies in the literature are all over the place, ranging from hair shedding starting in a matter of a week or two to some studies suggesting about a month is, is quite common, to some studies suggesting that 10 to 12 weeks is, is common. So we don't really have a clear indication, and it may in fact vary depending on the patient, depending on their severity of infection, hospitalization, et cetera. But so far, we have come to understand that there is a wide variation in when patients start shedding and anywhere from 20% to 60% of patients who have COVID-19 will experience telogen effluvium. And so more studies are on the way, larger studies are on the way as well. Our largest to date is 191 patients, but this is a very important topic. The next study I'd like to review with you is also very important for us to understand, and that is the association of red nail bands with telogen effluvium. And this was a study published in the Australasian Journal of Dermatology. And I often say to patients and the physicians I work with that hair and nails are like cousins. They're very closely related. The proteins in hair, the protein in nails are very closely related. Embryologically, they're very closely related. And it's not surprising that a variety of nail changes are associated with COVID-19. And in the past, Nail findings like Bose lines, red half moon nails, onychomedesis, and distal orange discoloration have been described. But a new study by Thacker and colleagues show that red nails may be associated with COVID-19 telogen effluvium. This isn't the first study of these red nail findings. Neri and colleagues in the JEADV published a study showing a patient who developed these red nail bands about two weeks after symptom onset, and these persisted and they became wider. And so here we have a study by Thacker and colleagues showing four patients with this red band in the nail finding. These were four female patients ranging in age from 30 to 39. The telogen effluvium in these patients started eight weeks, 11 weeks, 12 weeks, and 14 weeks after COVID-19. Hair loss had been occurring for about two to four weeks before they presented for medical advice. And nail examination showed a pattern of red bands in multiple digits in these four patients. And interestingly, one patient noticed these nail changes herself about four weeks after COVID-19 started, the other three patients were unaware 
And so these red nail bands are found in multiple nails. They follow the shape of the nail and they become wider over time. The cause of these red nail bands is really not understood, but it's been proposed by some that it may reflect this microvascular injury or procoagulant state that, that COVID-19 causes. And we've come to understand that the SARS-CoV-2 virus really targets blood vessels in a variety of systems in the body. And the microvasculature in the nail is certainly uh, one of the systems whereby the COVID-19 virus may target. Again, more studies are really needed. But why should you care about red bands in the nails? Well, you have to keep in mind that many patients present to clinic with telogen effluvium, hair shedding. It's a very common reason for patients to see doctors. And sometimes you order blood tests. You should order blood tests. You screen for thyroid, you screen for iron, you screen for anything else that the history seems to suggest. And very often you find no clear trigger. You ask the patient if they've had stress, have they had weight loss? Uh, have they started a new medication? Have they stopped a new medication? And sometimes it's pretty puzzling. In this COVID pandemic era, we always have to keep in mind that the patients had an asymptomatic COVID-19 infection in the past weeks or months. And many patients, in fact, are asymptomatic. The data ranges anywhere from 10% to 50%, to even 80% of patients, depending on the study you read, are completely asymptomatic for COVID-19. So many patients can't even imagine that they've had COVID-19. Maybe had a little bit of fatigue a few months ago or weeks ago. Well, so-and-so had infection, but I didn't get sick. I went to a party with 16 people got infected, but I didn't get infected. I think my immune system's great. These are stories we hear all the time during the COVID-19 era. And we have to keep in mind that many patients may have had COVID-19, but they were completely asymptomatic. And so the presence of red nail bands can be a helpful sign to us to indicate prior COVID infection. Of course, there are various blood tests that can, can look for infection. If you're in the acute stage, of course, you can do these various tests to look for infection, but these aren't accessible to everyone and you sometimes need the answer now as you're evaluating the patient. So check for these red nail bands. Uh, it's, it's a very helpful sign and it may indicate that the patient had COVID-19 infection and this may be the reason they're shedding hair. So from telogen effluvium related to COVID-19, let's talk about tinea capitis, the second T. An interesting study looked at the trichoscopic findings of tinea capitis and how they compare to alopecia areata in pediatric patients. Now, tinea capitis is very relevant when you're evaluating children. There are many, many reasons for children to lose hair, but you need to think about alopecia areata, trichotillomania, tinea capitis, telogen effluvium, hair shaft disorders. As the child gets a little bit older, androgenetic hair loss comes into the picture, but not until eight or nine, and usually not until 11 or 12. And so you need to understand very well alopecia areata, trichotillomania, tinea capitis, and telogen effluvium when you're evaluating children. And these can look somewhat similar. The use of trichoscopy is extremely helpful. These magnification, somewhat sometimes polarized devices, which help us to examine the scalp in a different way than we can see with the naked eye. And trichoscopy is incredibly helpful to evaluate these conditions. Many researchers over the last decade have identified important trichoscopic signs, changes in these little hair follicles that you see up close that indicate that the patient may have a certain hair condition. And so tinea capitis is common in children. The actual prevalence depends on the study you read and the part of the world that you're in. And it's in North America, it ranges anywhere from 0.5% to 18%. And certain racial backgrounds are more likely to have tinea capitis. Black children are more likely to have tinea capitis than Caucasian children and Hispanic children. 
it most commonly affects children age five to 10. Sure, it can affect older children, it can even affect adults, but this age group five to 10 is a very important age for tinea capitis and it has to be on your radar. Prepubertal uh, children before puberty are most likely affected by tinea capitis. It's thought that after puberty, the oil gland secretions are antifungal in some way, and this reduces the risk of tinea capitis. And so mycological examination is the gold standard for evaluating tinea capitis. We take a scraping, we send it off to the lab, we grow an organism, T. tonsurans, M. canis, et cetera. This takes time. Trichoscopy is extremely valuable to assist with diagnosis. We may still do scrapings to identify the organism. That helps us target treatments a little bit better, whether it's anthropophilic or zoophilic in terms of the organism. If a child has immigrated from another country, if a child has visited another country, these scrapings are really helpful, especially if a child is resistant to uh, the treatment that you're giving to them for tinea capitis. Knowing the organism is, is really valuable, but trichoscopy is a very quick tool and so this study by Gondog Du set out to evaluate trichoscopic differences between children with alopecia areata and tinea capitis. They studied 34 children with tinea capitis and 21 children with alopecia areata. The most common trichoscopic findings in tinea capitis were comma hairs and broken and dystrophic hairs followed by scaling. 97% of children had comma hairs. Corkscrew hairs, zigzag hairs, and pigtail, pigtail hairs were less common. And these are hairs that have a different type of a shape. A comma hair looks like a comma that you might punctuate a sentence with. Scaling just looks like flaking in the scalp. Broken hairs are hairs that have snapped off because the fungus infects the hair and makes it very weak. Corkscrew hair looks like a, a cork wine bottle opener. So these are these funny shaped hairs that really give us a clue that this child has tinea capitis quickly. In alopecia areata, the most common trichoscopic sign were exclamation mark hairs. This was seen in 61.9% of children. Not 100%, but 61.9%. Black dots, yellow dots, vellus hairs, and dystrophic hairs were also part of the trichoscopic findings of alopecia areata. And so a really helpful study, which reminds us that when you're thinking tinea capitis, go looking for those comma hairs, go looking for the scaling, certainly go looking for the other trichoscopic findings as well, but make sure you know what a comma hair is. And if you're not comfortable with the trichoscopic findings of tinea capitis, which many of us aren't, there's an absolutely wonderful review online. It's free by Waskiel Burnett and colleagues. And it is published in 2020. And in this study, the authors performed a systematic review of 37 studies of the trichoscopy of tinea capitis, evaluating 536 patients, 16 original reports, seven case series, and 14 case reports. And they do an absolutely wonderful job summarizing what are the characteristic findings on trichoscopy of tinea capitis and how sensitive and specific is all this. If you haven't had a chance to review this study by Waskiel, Bernat and colleagues, you really should. It's really a very, very nice study. Comma hairs were found in 52% of patients with tinea capitis overall in all of these studies followed by corkscrew hairs in 32%, Morse code hairs, zigzag hairs, bent hairs, black dots, and eye hairs were also found, but much less commonly, but they are characteristic findings of tinea capitis. Common findings, but really not so characteristic, are again this diffuse scaling. 89% of patients have this scaling, but you can get scaling in so many things. Dandruff can cause scaling. Perifollicular scaling can be seen, black dots and broken hairs can of course be seen in a large percentage, but this isn't really all that specific because you see this in 
tinea capitis, uh, trichotillomania, alopecia areata. But one of the tables, which I really like, and this is a very meticulously done study, is comma hairs had a sensitivity of 50% and a specificity of 99%. And these other trichoscopic findings like corkscrew hairs, Morse code hairs, zigzag hairs, bent hairs, block hairs, eye hairs, all these funny terms had specificity ranging from 99 to 100%. So it's really helpful to know what a comma hair is, what a corkscrew hair is, what Morse code hairs are, zigzag hairs, bent hairs, block hairs, eye hairs, because if you see them, it's very likely the child in front of you has tinea capitis. So it's very valuable to learn these particular trichoscopic findings, especially comma hairs and corkscrew hairs. Comma hairs look like a comma. Corkscrew hairs look like a corkscrew wine bottle opener. And so spend time looking at that free paper online, Waskiel, Bernat, and colleagues. And I'll put this, of course, in the show notes. Let's move on now to talk about trichotillomania. An interesting study, again, in the Journal of Clinical Psychopharmacology in the March-April 2022 issue, issue, which looks at an ADHD medication and the risk of trichotillomania. Trichotillomania is very important to understand in our pediatric patients. It will fool you in some cases. It mimics alopecia areata very often. Patients don't always give a good history. Parents don't always give a good history. There's a lot of stigma behind trichotillomania. So we need to understand trichotillomania very well and have it on our radar at any age, but especially in children. In young children age three, four, five, six, it's often a habit. It's often not associated with significant psychopathology, anxiety, and depression. But certainly, once you get into adolescence, it can be. And we can dramatically change people's lives if we identify trichotillomania, identify the underlying depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder that goes with it in many cases, and refer these patients for expert psychological or psychiatric care. And so the prevalence of trichotillomania ranges anywhere from 0.6 to 3.6% of adults, but hair pulling is very common. And so hair pulling may be even more common than this, but the studies suggest that anywhere from 0.6 to 3.6% of adults. The vast majority of patients with trichotillomania have another mental health issue. As I mentioned, anxiety, depression, OCD, post-traumatic stress, or ADHD. The DSM-5, or the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual version 5 for trichotillomania, has come out in recent years, and it differs from the DSM-4 TR. The DSM-4 TR said that if you're going to diagnose trichotillomania, there has to be some kind of tension before the patient pulls their hair. And then once they pull their hair, they have to have some kind of release of, the, uh, of that tension, some kind of gratification or pleasure after they pull. The DSM-5 says we don't need those criteria anymore. The criteria are you have to have pulling of the hair that results in hair loss. You have to have repeated attempts to stop the pulling. The pulling has to cause some kind of distress, and the pulling is not attributable to another medical condition as the primary cause. And the hair pulling is not better explained by another medical disorder or mental disorder. So these are the new DSM-5 criteria that have been out for several years now. And so let's talk about stimulant medication, and then we'll come back to this important link between stimulant medications and trichotillomania. So stimulant medications are widely prescribed for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And in fact, they're becoming more commonly prescribed in adults and children for attention deficit disorder. You're very common with some of these medications used for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, methylphenidate, which goes by names like Ritalin, Concerta, List Dexamphetamine, which goes by Vyvanse, Lvanse, and other names amphetamine, dextroamphetamine, which goes by Adderall. I mentioned both the generic and the trade names because many of you are very familiar with these trade names. They're becoming very commonplace 
in public language. There are some side effects with stimulant medications that we all need to be aware of. They decrease appetite. They can cause anxiety, diarrhea, dry mouth, insomnia, and sometimes some cardiovascular side effects as well. How do they work? Well, they raise dopamine and norepinephrine in the nerve terminals. And some of the ADHD medications like amphetamines and Listex, amphetamine increase monoamine release, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, from the vesicles into the intracellular fluid of neurons. And it's well shown in various animal studies that when you prime this dopamine system, you increase various, various stereotypic and grooming behaviors in animal models, including mice. And so we know that this particular dopamine pathway in the neuro neurologic system can trigger us for these type of stereotypic behaviors, including trichotillomania. And there are studies in the literature which support this. A recent study in January showed eight cases of trichotillomania induced by stimulant medications. Seven were in the pediatric population and one was an adult, but all patients were using stimulant medications for ADHD. And hair pulling began anywhere from several days to several months after a patient started using medications. Amphetamine, Listex amphetamine and methylphenidate were all on the list of medications that precipitated the disorder. So here we have a study by Jolly and colleagues that I'd like to review with you. It's another case of trichotillomania following ADHD medications. It was a nine-year-old boy who was diagnosed with ADHD and general anxiety. And he was started on list dexamphetamine, 30 milligrams a day. Two months later, he was admitted to inpatient psychiatry for severe anxiety, as well as hair loss. The patient started pulling the hair after taking list dexamphetamine. He had urges to pull the hair and relief after pulling the hair. Again, we don't use those criteria in the DSM-5 for trichotillomania diagnosis, but it certainly is helpful historical information for us. When the boy's dose of Listex amphetamine was increased from 30 to 50 to address some ADHD symptoms that he still had, the hair pulling worsened. Finally, the Listex amphetamine was tapered to 30 milligrams because he was having worsening anxiety. The author mentions that the patient had near complete loss of hair and a photo which accompanies this issue shows only a small patch of hair at the back around the neck and a patch on the middle of the scalp. And so we refer to that as the tonsure pattern of trichotillomania or the friar tuck pattern. It's a pattern of severe trichotillomania where patients just have a little rim of hair around the back. And the patient was also pulling out eyebrows Eventually, the list dexamphetamine was stopped. He was put on other medications to address the anxiety, and the hair pulling was eventually reduced, and he had some scalp regrowth. And so I think this is interesting. We need to be aware of this association, although seemingly rare, between ADHD medications and trichotillomania. There may be a link. I think the other point that I'd like to leave you with is not only do we need to be aware of this association, but we need to be aware that many children have other hair conditions besides trichotillomania. So when a child is pulling the hair and you're confident this is trichotillomania, don't stop there. Make sure you're not missing a diagnosis of infestations, scabies. Make sure you're not missing alopecia areata as well. Many children with alopecia areata also pull their hair. And so make absolutely certain when you're confident in trichotillomania that you're not missing another diagnosis as well that will fool you many times. And so from trichotillomania, let's move on to traction alopecia. Very interesting study in pediatric dermatology from November, looking at a rare case report of ulceration associated with traction alopecia. So traction alopecia is a form of hair loss whereby pulling forces on the hair lead to hair loss. 
And we're very familiar with traction alopecia from ponytails, braids, weaves, cornrows. Uh, these can all cause hair loss. What I'd like you to remember is, a, is several things about traction alopecia. And that is that early traction alopecia is associated with redness, tingling, itching, tenderness in the scalp. As it progresses, there may be papules or bumps, as well as pustules in the scalp. And then there may be some temporary hair loss. And if the traction forces are reduced, the hair might grow back. If they're not reduced, the patient may go on to develop permanent hair loss. So I'd like you to keep in mind this progression of traction alopecia. We often say to patients, ah, this is traction alopecia. Just stop what you're doing. The hair will grow back. That's true in early traction alopecia. That's not true in late traction alopecia. Traction alopecia is often misdiagnosed. Traction alopecia is very common in children. So we need to be aware of traction alopecia and we need to take it very seriously. And we'll talk a little bit about traction alopecia after we review this case. I think it's an incredibly important topic. Sometimes easy to diagnose, but the counseling is extremely important. And so this redness around the hairs in the earliest stages the headaches that patients develop are really, really important to be aware of. Dr. Kumalo from South Africa has done some very, very important work in traction alopecia. And she has shown that about 81% of patients with traction alopecia had symptoms during the hairstyling, especially headaches. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But patients with redness, headaches, itching, tenderness, Pustules, these are signs to us that, uh-oh, the forces on the hair are too great and we absolutely need to help the patient and the parents loosen these forces in a respectful, non-judgmental, non-shaming manner. So traction alopecia can occur in many different racial backgrounds. Black patients are at particularly high risk and it's estimated that about one third of black women experience traction alopecia. Again, this doesn't always grow back. And so we need to help patients identify traction alopecia in the earliest stages and help them develop hairstyling practices that reduce the risk of traction alopecia. So I'd like to review with you this study in pediatric dermatology from November by Johns and colleagues, which reports a unique case associated with ulceration. This was a case of ulceration and scarring alopecia when synthetic extensions, somewhat heavy synthetic extensions were placed into so-called lemonade braids. And if you're not familiar with lemonade braids, they are a side swept type of cornrow. And the hairstyle received its name from Beyonce's 2016 album, top selling album lemonade, in which she herself had these side cornrow style. And so this was a nine-year-old African-American girl, and she styled her hair not only with these lemonade braids, but with these synthetic extensions put into these lemonade braids. She denied any pain during the placement, but the braids were described as tight once finished. Three days later, she complained of headaches, scalp itching, and pain. And again, headaches, Itching, redness, pain, pustules, bumps. These are red flag signs that we all need to be aware of. The patient's mother noted that the braids on the crown in particular were tighter than the surrounding braids, and they were associated with some swelling. Upon removal of the braids, her mother noticed some blisters and some sores on the vertex, and then hair loss occurred in the following days. The patient saw her primary care physician who recommended washing the scalp twice weekly, prescribed a topical oral antibiotic, prescribed an oral antibiotic, ketoconazole conazole shampoo, and a topical antibiotic twice daily. Unfortunately, the patient's condition worsened and she was brought to the emergency department. And this was 11 days after putting on the lemonade braids with these synthetic extensions. In the emergency room, the patient had no fever, 
dermatology came and saw her. It was identified that she had these ulcerations in the scalp accompanied by hair loss. Swabs were done. They came back with just normal flora and no clear infection. And the final diagnosis was skin necrosis and ulceration from traction alopecia. The patient was sent home with the recommendation to stop the oral antibiotic, stop ketoconazole shampoo, to wash the scalp with a mild cleanser twice daily and put mupirocin ointment on and a petrolatum soaked dressing. And so she was followed by dermatology for several months after leaving the emergency room to monitor for healing. And after 11 weeks, the ulcer healed, but there was residual scarring. And at six months of follow-up, the young girl did have some regrowth, but there were small areas of permanent hair loss. And so it's uncommon to have ulcers with traction alopecia. And here the, the authors felt that it was the weight of these synthetic extensions that were placed into the lemonade braids that led to ischemia or a cessation of blood flow. And most causes of traction alopecia occur after many weeks, but here it occurred after many days of, pl of placement of this synthetic um, extensions into the lemonade braid. So traction alopecia can occur quickly in the right setting. Here, the synthetic extensions were heavy. There was ulcerations that occurred from ischemia. This is a very nice case report. The ulcer, the Authors remind us here that most cases of ulceration with hairstyling happen in African-American patients when you look in the literature, and they propose that Black individuals might be predisposed not only to traction alopecia, but an increased risk of ulceration associated with um, traction alopecia. So traction alopecia is a really important issue. It's often misdiagnosed. Early intervention is so important. We need to recognize the signs of redness, itching, pain, tenderness, pustules that, that are associated with the early stages. And we need to be comfortable talking to parents about traction alopecia. And even in children that are presenting not for hair issues, we have to be comfortable talking about traction alopecia if we think it's an issue. Um, I had the honor to work with the legendary dermatologist, Bernice Kravchuk, who we sadly lost recently. But, you know, Bernice would often say to patients who came in for various issues, whether it was eczema or atopic dermatitis or other issues, who she suspected traction alopecia, she would counsel patients about traction alopecia. And as I reflect on this, I, I really smile and it really reminds me of how important this is because this has the potential to change a person's life forever. Because if we can identify traction alopecia at early stages and respect, respectfully tell parents that this might be a little heavy, that this might increase the risk of permanent hair loss, we can help a child's hair forever. And so it's not so much that some of these styles need to be stopped, but rather they need to be modified to reduce the risk of traction alopecia. And if you tell parents to stop, well, that's often going to be viewed as unrealistic, impractical, and you're going to lose trust between your parent. And uh, that's really, really important that, that you keep that trust. So we must never shame parents, but we simply need to encourage them to avoid tight hairstyles and to take breaks from some of these types of hairstyles. So we need to help parents understand that that traction alopecia does carry a risk of permanent hair loss, and that headaches, tingling, redness, bumps, and pustules are all really a sign, but especially these headaches. And if you're not familiar with Dr. Kamalo's contributions to the literature, you really should. This 2008 study is so important, and it reminds us that 81% of patients with traction have symptoms during hair styling. So pain after hair styling is one of the earliest signs of traction alopecia, and it must be given a lot of attention. Parents aren't going to know a lot about how to monitor perifollicular redness, pustules, and bumps. 
We see that with trichoscopy. We know how to recognize that. But pain after hairstyling is so important. Headaches after hairstyling is so important. And some patients and some parents and some adults have come to learn that these symptoms are just normal and they're a part of what we expect when we apply these hairstyles. You should expect some pain. It's just part of how you live with these hairstyles. That's not correct. And we have to help our parents and our patients, whether children or adults, come to understand that those are the body's way of telling us that it's too tight. And Dr. Kumalo showed us that painful braids and pimples are associated with a twofold increased risk of traction alopecia. So we need to be comfortable with these signs. There are just five or six of them, but come to be comfortable with itching, headaches, papules, bumps that are associated with traction alopecia. Traction alopecia can occur in children and adults of any racial background, but black patients with tight curl patterns are really at increased risk. And please remember that applying traction hairstyle to chemically or thermally relaxed hair dramatically increases the risk of traction alopecia. And so that's it for this week, everyone. I'd like to thank you so much for listening. To recap, we've reviewed telogen effluvium and the risk of telogen effluvium in those patients using isotretinoin, anywhere from a three to a six fold, uh, 6% risk of telogen effluvium may come from the risk of the use of isotretinoin. We talked about post COVID hair loss and the fact that women are much more affected the literature ranges anywhere from a month to 10 to 12 weeks after infection that a person, person first notices hair loss. We talked about this interesting red nail band finding. We talked about trichoscopy of tinea capitis and the importance of recognizing comma hairs, as well as some of these other trichoscopic findings, which have very specific uh, associations with tinea capitis and I directed you to a free review online of the trichoscopic findings of tinea capitis. We talked about the association between stimulant medications and trichotillomania. It's not common, but it certainly is something we need to be aware of. And we talked about one stimulant medication here that caused trichotillomania. And finally, we talked about a rare association between traction alopecia and ulceration and the progression from headaches, itching, tenderness, to red bumps and pustules, to temporary hair loss and permanent scarring hair loss that can occur in traction alopecia and how you can change the lives of patients forever by helping recognize traction alopecia in the earliest stages and recommending periods whereby these hairstyles are loosened. And that's it for this week. I wanna thank you so much to rate or comment wherever you're listening, please do so. If you'd like to contact us, please contact us via email at info at donovanhairacademy.com. We're back next week talking about scarring alopecia, and I'll look forward to welcoming you back here on Evidence-Based Hair. <laughs>